Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Welcome, everybody. Uh, do not adjust your radio dials or do adjust your radio dials if you want, but still going to be me here back hosting again. So, so good to be back. Um, we have got an especially wonderful call today. We're going to start off with the topic, state appropriations for, for higher ed. Um, 101, this is just kind of a, um, a really hot topic in higher ed right now. We've all been reading a lot, I'm sure, about how it's various state houses across the country. Appropriations for higher ed are being cut or are potentially going to be cut. Um, and um, we were thinking that this might be a topic that while it's interesting to many of you, you may not have a background uh, about what that is, how that works, who does it. Um, and so we're lucky to have Colleen Fal Falkerstern from WICHE, uh, who handles these, these issues and, and many others on, on tuition um, for, for WICHE. So Colleen, are you there? Okay, I thought I saw Colleen on my list, but maybe I did not. Um, all right, let's go ahead then and move on. Do I have something in my chat here? Okay, do I have someone? Um, so um, we're gonna move on then. And if Colleen comes on, we will uh, circle back to her. Um, we know that's, that you all have um, different responsibilities within your, within your institutions and um, enrollment management is a really interesting area and it's overlap with state authorization in general. Uh, but especially now in COVID with how enrollment has or hasn't changed. So we, we wanted to get some perspectives from the membership on that. And uh, when I reached out um, over Mix to ask for volunteers, I actually had three. We had spot for two on this call and we'll have uh, Becky Butcher from Northern Arizona another time. But we will start with Stacy Dam from Bryan College, as a College of Health Sciences. Stacy, are you there? We'll move on <laughs> to our next. Uh, you know what? I, I, we're just so good and efficient at getting started on time. <laughs> I think that's our problem there, Dan. Um, okay. oh, I think I'm... people are still rolling in. And uh, okay. so fortunately, I think we can just reset. Reset. Okay. Colleen, are you here? I am here. here All is. right. Hi, Take it away. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was having some trouble getting in, but I think I'm good, obviously, now. So. Um, I am going to just talk a little bit about state appropriations and finance policy for higher education. Um, and a, a caveat before I get started, and you'll kind of hear throughout um, the discussion, is that the, the states have significant autonomy in higher education and funding of higher education. So the process, the funding the mechanisms, it looks very different across the board, um, across states. And so I'm trying to present it in as much of a general case as possible. And I'll highlight when there's some specific things that um, vary pretty greatly across state. Um, but if you think about kind of big picture, what are appropriations and kind of what are the goal of appropriations in higher education? The overarching goal is to provide adequate funding to carry out the education goals of the state. And so most funding is gonna come through the legislative process and the budgeting process of a given state. Um, with the expectation of um, covering operating expenses, typically from the general fund of the state, there's obviously some additional capital um, expenditures that will come up. Um, but for the most part, what I'm talking about is kind of the big pot of appropriations um, to fund public higher education. And so if I, you think about this kind of from two, two key groups of stakeholders and the different roles that they play in the budgeting process, um, the first being the role of higher education, and I, I use that term kind of broadly, but what I mean by higher education um, is kind of the agencies, so the governing, coordinating boards, um, the systems of higher education the institutions, because it's going to look very different in each state and kind of who is the representation of higher education when it comes to requesting budget um, and funds for higher education appropriations. And then um, uh, the other key body of actors is the legislature. Um, and then I'd also include the executive branch of a state in that case as well. Um, and the role that they play in the, in the budgeting process, approving the budget um, and enacting that budget. So if we think about the timeline of appropriations, typically, as I've mentioned, um, it's gonna come through the budget process in the legislative session. Um, and so that typically will happen in the late winter, early spring. Um, so the budget process really starts the, the preceding summer. 
Um, and so, as I mentioned, the higher education entity, whoever that might be in a given state, the governing board, the coordinating board, the institutions themselves, will put forth a budget request um, based off the operating budget of the institutions for the forthcoming fiscal year. Over the course of the fall, they'll work with the executive branch um, in that request. And then um, prior to the, at the beginning of the legislative session um, in the winter is when the governor is gonna present their budget. Um, in the spring, throughout the legislative session, the legislature passes their budget for the upcoming fiscal year. If there's um, potential for veto um, from the governor, but traditionally that's the process in which um, appropriations are allocated in terms of higher ed um, and how that money is, is allocated across the institutions is going to come through the appropriations bills and the state budget. Um, and then in the summer, the budget for the new fiscal year is enacted, and then we start the process over again with the budget request for the upcoming fiscal year. So it's, it's an ongoing process and coordination between um, the higher education stakeholders as well as the government stakeholders in the legislature and the executive branch. Um, for the most part, states uh, have an annual budget process. Some states operate by a biennium. Um, and there's obviously things that can come up and there's special sessions such as COVID and um, needing to come back in to um, adjust the budget. And so there's kind of a always, always opportunity to um, revise and adjust throughout the budget cycle process as well. And important to note. Um, so that's kind of the, the process in terms of appropriations, but it's also higher education plays a key role in how we think about how those funds go from the, the big tax pot of appropriations to the actual institutions themselves. Um, and so again, very dependent on the state. So kind of a general rule of thumb is if your state has a governing board, so thinking about a single governing board for the entire state, um, for the most part, the funds are gonna go from allocation to that, organ, um, to that entity of the governing board and then going to be allocated out to the institutions. Um, some have a coordinating board where they might be the intervening um, governing body to, to disperse the funds, um, but some of it might go to the institutions themselves. So for example, in Nevada, they have the state system for higher education. They receive the lump sum from the legislature. They allocate according to their given formula um, out to their institutions, both two and four year. California, they have three separate systems of higher education. Each system is gonna receive their um, sum of appropriations and then they're gonna to allocate to their institutions. Um, New Mexico, each institution has its own kind of autonomy and governing structure. Um, and so the institutions themselves receive their allocation um, from the state. So Avi looks very different across the state in terms of who, who the higher education entity is, what their role is and how they kind of disperse those funds. And there's also differences in kind of the, the standing formula or structure for how, how they go about appropriating um, funds. So if you think about kind of this traditional model of funding um, on one end of the spectrum would be more of an enrollment based um, funding structure where, um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, if you think about appropriations as kind of like providing adequate funding, cover the operating expenses of an institution, um, you would have your base based off of the combination of the enrollment and the, the mission of that institution. So obviously within a given state, institutions play different roles in kind of what they are for the state. A larger research institution that serves more students has a larger operating budget compared to a smaller institution that serves less students, maybe um, less, more of a regional focus of the institution. So the base is kind of based off what, what the students that they're serving, what does the operating budget of those institutions look like? Um, and then funding would be uh, kind of like a base funding would be have to do with, um, for the most part, FTE. On the other end of the spectrum, we can think about um, funding through a performance-based funding model. And so this is something particularly the last 10, 15 years has really um, risen in popularity across the states. And so if you think about performance-based funding model, it, it is what it says it is, and it, it's more of an outcomes-based approach. Um, so thinking about kind of what is the retention of the students going through completion, um, it, they can be very complex and they can be used in different ways across states. Um, there can be specific bonuses for certain degrees. So if a state has identified a certain industry, um, there might be bonus allocations based off STEM fields or based off certain academic disciplines. There can be um, bonus points for um, serving low-income students, underrepresented minority students. So they, that's kind of the other opposite end of the spectrum. In reality, most states operate somewhere in between um, where they have some type of combination 
of base funding based on enrollment, kind of the historical operating expenses of the institution from year to year. Um, and then the, any type of new money might be allocated through performance-based funding. Um, so it's kind of, it's intermixed um, across the two kind of traditional um, funding stream or um, mechanisms in terms of those different types of models. Um, it's also important to note that in some states, performance-based funding is only used for a certain sector. So just in the two year, just in the four year. Um, so as I've mentioned multiple times, it's gonna look very different from state to state. I also think it's important to note that um, higher education typically looks at the budget process through the lens of higher education. What are the operating expenses of the institutions in order to meet the education goals? Um, where the state legislature is looking at the state budget from the entirety of the state budget, correct? So um, as we know, states have a ba balanced budget requirement. And so if you look across different spending, ex uh, spending expenditure or expenditure categories, um, you have legal obligations to K-12, to healthcare, um, the increase in the share of Medicaid um, as a state expenditure has, has been a topic of conversation over the last 10 years. And so you have these mandatory spending categories, um, whereas higher education is gonna fall into a discretionary spending category. Um, and part of the argument to be made with higher education is that unlike K-12, higher education has alternative revenue streams. Um, so while state support has been the historical kind of foundation of funding for higher education, um, we know that higher education institutions and systems have uh, other revenue streams. So typically the alternative re uh, revenue streams for higher education, the first one is going to be tuition and fees. So um, according to the most recent Chef report, about 46% of um, uh, revenue per student came from tuition and fees in fiscal year 2019. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion over the past two decades about the, the shift in kind of the share of um, reliance of revenue coming from tuition and fees away from state support. Um, other revenue includes auxiliary revenue, um, which is something that, again, has been a big top of, topic of conversation in relation to COVID. Um, I like to think of auxiliary revenue as kind of what is the capital that the institutions have and a way to make revenue off of said capital. So things like room and board, parking, dining, um, larger institutions that rent out their space. So that's been a big impact in terms of COVID, um, particularly back in March when institutions were swiftly moving students off campus. Um, some states were offering, or institutions were offering rebates on these um, funding sources. And it was a big impact um, since the onset of COVID. The federal government obviously plays a key um, role in the financing of higher education, not necessarily through direct appropriations to the institutions. Um, typically, the largest funding from the, from the federal government is going to come through um, Title IV and federal financial aid, um, so and through the source of to students in terms of federal financial aid. Another key role that the federal government has played, particularly in the last eight months, is a through stimulus um, and through the CARES Act. So there was a um, significant amount of money for higher education um, in the initial stimulus package through CARES Act. Um, some of that went directly to institutions. Some of it went up to the impact on students. Um, and then potential stimulus funds, um, nothing that is um, going to be imminent, but you know, potential stimulus funds through um, this current economic climate. Um, will come through the fine, um, federal government as well. And lastly, through different grants. Um, some of that goes directly to institutions for larger projects. I'm thinking about Title III funding um, for minority serving institutions, as well as different grants and stuff focused on research. Um, one thing I wanna mention, and it, I probably could have talked about this in the appropriations, is also the role of local funding. And um, that's particularly gonna come through in the community colleges. Um, so a lot of states have locally controlled community college districts that are going to be supported in some part from their local government. Um, but if we think that 50 states have different systems, um, then it, once we get into the municipalities, um, things are gonna start looking very different as well. So, but I do wanna highlight that there are um, some share of revenue that comes from local um, support. And the last kind of key piece, so I've talked about appropriations, I've talked about um, tuition and the kind of the shift over the past two decades around um, tuition and the reliance on tuition um, and the student share. 
But the third kind of key piece, if you think about state finance policy, it's going to be in the, in the way of um, state-sponsored financial aid. Um, so this is another huge source of monetary support from the state to, um, to higher education through um, financial aid programs. So at this point, almost every state has a state-sponsored financial aid program. Um, some of them are need based, some of them are merit-based, um, some of them incorporate some type of combination of both. Um, and so it's important to note because um, in the same way that appropriations kind of represent a, a, uh, an intention to carry out the education goals of the state, the state financial aid programs do so as well. Um, if you think about really focusing in on need-based aid to support the lowest income students um, and making college as affordable as possible for those students, um, some states use merit aid to incentivize students, to, um, high performing students to stay and remain in state for higher education. Um, so it really is a policy lever that's used to incentivize um, student action and behavior and support the, the state's um, uh, education goals as a whole. And so at which you would really like to think about all three um, in combination and alignment with one another. And so that's appropriations, tuition and financial aid um, in ensuring that there's an alignment across all three, um, because they really are very closely related um, finance levers. And it's important as a state thinks about their priorities and how they go about carrying out those priorities. So for example, um, if you think about affordability, it's a, it's a priority of many states. Um, I like to think that it's not so much of the end, but really a means to an end. Um, and it carries through a lot of different policies. Um, but if you think about affordability in the, in the lens of appropriations, tuition, and financial aid, typically what happens we know is when um, during economic downturns is when we see the biggest cut in state appropriations, um, where states kind of use higher education to balance their budget when there's less, less funds available after the mandatory spending, there's going to be cuts to higher education. Um, but if the, if the reaction to decreases in cuts in higher education is increases in tuition and fees, um, to kind of fill any backstop, then that's going to put um, a burden on students and families. And financial aid has an opportunity to kind of support students' ability to access and afford higher education. Um, and it oftentimes actually in economic downturns, financial aid is able to remain steady. But in some cases, financial aid cover, state financial aid covers less than $100 per student. And so um, there's discrepancy in kind of what the available funds for supporting students is. And so it's important to think about all three of these key components in coordination with one another um, to, to ensure that states are meeting their priorities and not having implications of, of causing more barriers um, to access to affordable higher education for their population in order to meet their goals. Um, I think I've gone over my time, um, so I'm going to wrap up there, um, but my colleague, Christina Sendi is also on the call. And so um, if she has anything to add as well. No, Colleen, I think you did a wonderful job. Thanks so much. I think the only thing I might say is that in, in many ways, I think the deep cuts coming as a result of COVID and the resulting economic downturn have actually started, I think in some cases, forcing states to really think about this alignment. So you'd see, for example, and um, you'll see, California's budget that they passed, what they did is they said you have the, the systems will get one allocation if they get federal stimulus money and one al one allocation if they don't. And so really trying to just manage all these different lev levers as carefully as possible because we're just, you know, we're really just looking for everything we have at this point to kind of support students as much. Um, but I think that's the only thing I would add. This is Cheryl. I, I just want to step in here and, and thank Colleen for uh, coming on our call today and for Christina's uh, additions. Uh, Colleen is a, a colleague of ours in Wichy. Um, we didn't get a chance to uh, tell everybody about you, Colleen. Would you mind sharing a little bit um, so that folks know uh, your your role in Wichy? Of course. Um, so my name is Colleen Falkenstern. I work in the Policy Analysis and Research Unit at Wichy. Um, and my title is a research analyst. I work on a wide range of projects um, within the unit. Um, but the kind of key thing that I do is oversee our um, annual data resources, which include an annual report of tuition and fees in the West, um, our regional fact book for higher education, and um, our benchmarks uh, series. And so a lot of data, higher education data analysis, um, finance related, enrollment related. Um, and demographics as well. 
So that's kind of, and then I, I touch point on a lot of our grant funded projects as well. Yeah, well, this is a real treat to be able to have you on our call, Colleen. I think this is the first time you've been on one of our SAN calls, am I right? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Well, yes. So it's great to have you here. Um, does anybody have any questions for Colleen? Um, while I uh, fawn over her a little bit about how lucky we are to have her today and um, you know that she was able to provide this in-depth information um, about the situation that we're finding right now. Any additional questions? This is Dan. I have one question. Um, and also just a reminder that um, some of you who may not be fully aware of, of how it works, the, the W in WCET stands for WICHE, so, um, which in turn stands for Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. So many acronyms. I can get, can get lost sometimes in where we are, but we are, we are a part of WICHE, and we love when our WICHE colleagues are able to contribute um, to these types of events. My one question is, um, with, with tuition as a, as a way of making up for, in some cases, the uh, decrease in appropriations, are you seeing any systems who are looking to increase out-of-state students? And then if so, because that tends to be higher tuition, and if so, how does that bump up against the goals? Um, I mean, I think that there has been, um, I think the, the increase of out-of-state students, thinking about that from a institution by institution perspective, I think there's been a lot of studies that have been done, um, particularly on state flagship institutions and kind of their um, increase in out-of-state students. Obviously it is a revenue, a source of revenue. Um, typically, there's also a lot of merit aid that's used as a way to incentivize um, students to come to public um, flagship institutions through, um, so even with deep discounts um, of out-of-state tuition, it's still revenue source for the institutions. And so I think that there, there are some questions there about what, what is the role of some of these institutions for their state as a whole. Um, and how, how does um, the increasing share of out-of-state students align with the historical mission of those institutions and kind of what, what their role is um, for the state. So I think, I do think that there, there's um, a trend of that happening in different places. Some states have um, legislation that's going to um, restrict the, the share of out-of-state students um, put into place or system policies to put, to limit um, out-of-state students and so, um, there are some kind of like uh, uh, barriers put into place to, to, to stop that expansion, um, but it's definitely something that has been occurring over the last decade, two decades, for sure. Okay, great. Well, if there are, um, um, unless there are any other questions, I will thank Colleen and Christina again and move on to the enrollment, man enrollment management meets state authorization phase of our call today. Um, Stacy Dam, are you here? Okay, so we'll go on to Patricia Milner from University of Arkansas. Patty, are you here? I am, can you all hear okay. me? Yes, take it away. Great. Uh, so I work for the University of Arkansas. I'm the Assistant Vice Provost for Student Outreach and Innovation in Global Campus. So the way that we sort of operate at the University of Arkansas is that Global Campus is a service unit uh, to the rest of the institution that explicitly serves um, distance education students and programs which are housed within their um, home academic unit. So our unit doesn't own any academic programs, we just provide services to those academic programs. And so we provide um, both enrollment management support and um, compliance out of my unit. Um, and so we do state authorization, uh, federal disclosure, license programs, those kinds of things in our compliance um, office. And then we do recruitment and uh, student support for students in the application and um, yield process, but we don't actually own the application. Those exist in their respective um, 
graduate and undergraduate admissions offices. So we kind of really do live like right in the middle of um, enrollment and compliance. Uh, so uh, some of the things, you know, that changed or the challenges that we faced going into this fall really were just the, the rapidly changing environment and how quickly decisions were being made um, and how quickly everyone needed to react to those decisions. And so the reality is for, <clears throat> for fall 20, a lot of what was gonna happen had already happened by the time that COVID really hit in our area, which was you know mid-March. Um, and so many of the policies around enrollment management didn't change much because the classes were pretty well set by March for our traditional programs, both at the graduate and undergraduate level. In online, that definitely wasn't true. We we're still hot and heavy in recruitment season, but you know things didn't change as much for online as they did in other places. Um, overall, you know, we came out where it seems like most people are coming out, which is that our online programs grew, our graduate programs grew, and our undergraduate was. Um, what we are calling flat, but was actually down, but less than like a dozen students. Um, so the timing of when things happened in late March, we did implement some changes in policy. We did um, go to test optional, uh, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. But again, most of the students who were gonna be admitted for fall had already been admitted at that point. Um, rolling through like what did that actually mean when you saw students for the fall, there were other changes that had to be made there. So one of those was extending deferral. So allowing students to defer an entire year versus just a semester was one of the things that we implemented. Um, and we also implemented allowing sort of no cost reapplication. So if you had applied for fall, but decided not to come, you could reapply for a future term without repaying the application fee, which for us was a huge concession because the University of Arkansas doesn't waive um, application fees lightly. Um, the, the one of the things I do think that we did that really helped us in understanding the compliance elements of what would happen this fall was that we had clearly defined lines from the administration about what was an online class and what was a remote class. So um, as we rolled into fall, one of the largest pieces that changed for us was trying to understand where students would actually be located when they were studying. So our institution, our chancellor determined that every faculty member and every student would have the option to be fully remote. So we still have physical classes on our campus and we have lots of students living on campus but far fewer than we do in, in most years. And we allowed every student to choose whether they would come to campus or study from some other location. And so that created um, a lot of compliance potential issues. And one of the ways that we had to sort that out was really defining whether a student was going to be studying online or whether a student was gonna be studying remotely and the difference between that synchronous and asynchronous became particularly important when we started dealing with international students. Um, and I would say for us, that was definitely the biggest change to um, how we have dealt with compliance in the past. Previously, we hadn't really had a lot of interaction with international um, because our online degree seeking students are mostly domestic. We don't have a large international um, population of online degree seeking international students. And so we hadn't had a lot of interaction with them, but when it became clear that it was gonna be much more difficult for students to come to the US or to return to the US, then we really um, had to dig in and do a lot of research and begin to establish completely different processes than our university had had before to help um, moderate the risk of students choosing to study from a country where we have not yet had the opportunity to determine whether or not we could be in compliance. Um, and that all happening in a period of really three or four weeks before the semester started. 
Um, we also had some faculty who were um, internationally stuck um, and we had to deal with the potential of what does it mean for them to try to teach classes from an international location. And so um, that process, you know, we worked um, to develop a prioritized list of what countries were they the most interested in? Did we have the most students um, in that situation? And then we had people really dig into that research. At the same time, we worked to develop a kind of standardized disclosure form that said, here's the common risks we think a student might face by taking courses from their home country um, in terms of tax limitations and um, you know, access to resources and um, all of those other kinds of things. We also developed sort of lists of these are the no-go countries really quickly so that um, the international programs could work individually with students to try to figure out if there was an option, um, if they needed to be put on some kind of extended um, deferral or leave um, of absence as a student, those kinds of things. Um, and then we helped coordinate meetings with um, the powers that be, uh, the provost office, the vice president, finance administration, research and sponsored programs, international and legal to really work through the individual circumstances where we felt like there were some pretty clear red flags to whether or not this would be allowed and, and what did we need to do to try to support students and faculty um, through that process. We also participated in some webinars with the graduate school for program coordinators um, and with uh, international programs for some of their um, partners and constituency groups that were um, dealing with that. Um, the other thing that kind of hit us just a little oddly is of course we were trying to implement the new federal disclosure rules at the same time that all this was happening. Um, and we had devised a system that we felt like we was manageable, um, but it really you know, was making the assumption that the vast majority of the students studying at the University of Arkansas would be studying from Arkansas. And then all of a sudden, many of our students were studying from their home states, which were not Arkansas. And so that really um, created kind of a whole new round of um, logic and implementation that had to go into ensuring that we were appropriately following those federal disclosure rules based on how our institution had um, defined location, uh, which was around where the student was going to be when they were actually studying. And so that when that location changed, making sure that we were being fully compliant around uh, giving those disclosures to students who suddenly changed their intended location from Arkansas to Texas or Missouri or Connecticut or wherever else they were. Um, so that's some of the ways we, we worked with them kind of uniquely through this year. Um, I think I think right now we're all about what are the challenges for next year, right? And what does it mean to um, to implement, to continue to implement changes in test optional um, policies? How will that impact the ways we collect data and the reporting that we have to do? Um, and then what will be the ongoing kind of implications of the student location for remote teaching. Um, by and large, our position was that a student who is studying remotely is not seeking a degree at a distance. They are temporarily located in another place. Um, and so they are not, you know, it's just different. Um, and that's the way we sort of had to deal with a lot of the international um, pieces. But as we move forward, um, if we do this for another year, then we really do get into, particularly at the graduate level, students who are really seeking full degrees being offered at a distance. And that dramatically changes the compliance landscape for that because it's no longer sort of a temporary um, issue. It's become more of a long-term plan. And um, so, you know, it's, that's just one of the things we're really trying to watch and understand, um, particularly in relationship to international students. Um, and how that that may change or not change in the next six to nine months.
That's great. That was really packed with information and it is quite a soup that you, you're describing between enrollment management and, and state authorization. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, hearing none, um, I'm going to move on. Yes, to uh, Stacey Dam is here, I believe, um, making a, a dramatic entrance. And she will talk about these issues from the perspective of Bryan College and Bryan College of Health Sciences, which we're reading today. Stacey, welcome. Thank you very much. I, I have issues with my time zones, apparently. I really apologize for the dramatic entry here, but thank you for accommodating um, this time. So my name is Stacey Dam. I'm the Dean of Enrollment Management here at Bryan College of Health Sciences. Um, I have a few slides if I'd be able to share those or I can send those along later if that's okay. Sharing and now you can share. Thank you. Sure. So I've been with um, Bryan College of Health Sciences now for three and a half years. So just a little bit of an overview of our current enrollment. We serve over 800 students and just over 700 of those are degree seeking. We've grown by over 14% here in the past three years. Um, our graduate student enrollment is now at about 15%. Our graduate student enrollment is one of our larger out of state groups that we offer degrees to. And you'll notice that I didn't put an international student population here because we do not have the SEVA status to enroll on our campus international students. We do occasionally have international students who enroll in our fully online simulation certificate um, or healthcare management certificate, um, but that's kind of few and far between. Our out-of-state student population does vary between 10 and 15 percent semester by semester, depending on which programs we're enrolling for at those different times. So to frame our conversation, these are the programs that we offer that lead to licensure, which leads us into those state authorization questions. We do offer a Bachelor of Science in Nursing here on our campus. We have two different degrees in sonography. We offer a Doctor of Nursing Anesthesia practice, our fully online simulation education certificate, and we have on-campus nursing assistant and phlebotomy programs that could lead to licensure depending on the state that you reside in. So I like to share this statement. Um, our enrollment management team picked something that, that we like to rally around each year, and we thought that this was very fitting um, statement in a dissertation that we were reading that frames enrollment management and what we do. Specifically this year, we liked um, the last part of this phrase. So enrollment management's end is to create and maintain dynamic enrollment conditions that allow the institution to survive and persist regardless of the forces that push it toward extinction. So I think that a few more things, um, I know extinction may sound dramatic, but I think that a few more things have been added to our list you know, this year, there are those outside forces that we have to keep an eye on at any given time. Um, and one of those is our state authorization process. So um, I'm very thankful for our dedicated um, ed development team that we work with on a very regular basis to help us with the different steps of state authorization. Deb Meter is fantastic working with our team to make sure that we are up to date on everything that's out there. And so when these new regulations um, started coming down to be due this past summer, our immediate reaction was, wow, this is a lot, this is stressful. How are we going to manage all of this? Um, we are not a large institution. We wear a lot of different hats. And so to make sure that we were able to follow you know, the letter of the new state authorization guidelines for each of our students. 
um, became a challenge to begin with. And so what these implications for our college were, um, you know, leading to the stress of can we no longer recruit in places that have been very good recruitment places for us? Are we not able to digitally market, which digital marketing is so important right now when you're not able to get into schools um, to speak with students directly? Are we not able to, to um, continue? Do we need to have, you know, teach out strategies for these different places and then no longer um, offer these programs for students that live in different states. So it was very stressful, a little overwhelming, um, but what we did to get over that first stress was to just let's break it all down and get everyone in a room. That was our first step. So we thought who needs to be in those initial conversations, get everyone in a room and start breaking these pieces down. So we included our deans and program directors to begin with those who oversee the programs listed earlier. Uh, my team, including our CRM manager, talking about how we can make this all flow in the system, our distance education staff and our provost. So first, it's just so important to determine who needs to be included initially, who is going to be a part of actually implementing the processes and procedures that we're going to be agreeing to and holding one everyone accountable to and making sure that what we're putting in place truly does work for our institution to be able to manage and upkeep. So after we got everyone in the room, started having those conversations of what does this truly mean for us? What does it mean for each of our programs? We started putting you know, keyboard to Google Doc and were able to start creating policy drafts of how we thought we could manage these new regulations. And it was really a team effort led by our distance education director. As things continued to evolve and change, um, we did a lot of different drafts and modifications and then we were able to pass policies through our different structures here at the college. While we were creating those policies and procedures, our team, the enrollment management team who oversees our CRM um, was also doing some work behind the scenes to make sure we were able to go live when we needed to. So part of this process that we created were um, we included different pieces into our enrollment forms. So our enrollment forms ask, you know, the standard, you know, what's your t-shirt size? Like send a t-shirt and then where are you going to, um, you know, update your mailing address and, and those kinds of things. But we also added were some licensure and certification pieces to see where were you planning on studying while you are earning this degree? Where do you plan to look for employment after you graduate? Just so we could start collecting those data pieces, um, testing those forms, making sure that we were able to pull the reports that we needed. So updating our enrollment forms was a big piece of being ready for this new process updating our messaging. So making sure that students who came from different states, we were able to auto-populate these messages in to them. So they're notified immediately upon inquiry or application to any of our programs. We also needed to update our application. So one piece um, that I think is a little unique is if a student chose, for example, our simulation um, education certificate. Um, no, I'll go back. So let's say they decided to choose our Bachelor of Science in Nursing program, but their address stated that they were outside of the United States. A pop-up box would say, we're not able to offer this program to students in your area. Please choose a different program. So that we were immediately notifying students that they wouldn't be eligible if it's true what they're putting on the application. We thought that that was an important step so we're not processing additional applications in a way that we knew we weren't going to be able to offer these programs. Um, we also had a large revision to our website and 
Deb did a phenomenal job creating this licensure and certification disclosure page that you can see there. And I encourage you to go onto the site if you don't have one already for your institution. It lays out each of our different um, programs and whether or not we meet, we don't know if we meet or we may meet um, the needs of the state where the student may be residing. And it's a great one-stop resource for our recruitment team, for interested students and parents who may be looking into our different programs. So step three is kind of a two-step process, creating those policies and procedures, and then also making sure in the back end we were developing so we were able to meet what we were setting out to do. So we decided to roll out the policies. Um, so one thing to, you know, as you're writing new policies and implementing them, it's always important to go back and, and check. Um, just read the letter, stay up, um, up to date. If questions come up, refer back to that policy just to make sure everyone's on board, everybody understands and is following what we all agreed upon doing and being flexible. Um, being flexible is really important. Um, we found in not only our current environment, but with all of the, the state authorization pieces, that guidelines are gonna change, requirements on us are going to be changing. And so I think that's why we wanted to make sure we were emphasizing the importance of getting infrastructure set up, getting our application, getting our website, getting our enrollment forms in a piece. So as guidelines were changing, we could pivot pretty quickly because we had a pretty good foundation um, that we felt that we had in place as we're following our plan. So where are we now? Um, so we've been about a year now out from this process and we have just submitted an update to our policy, um, a small revision that we decided that we were going to include that a specific deadline as to when all of our notification was going to be done. And we'll be passing that through our leadership council, just so everyone's on the same page. We didn't have undergraduate nursing doing their, their checks at a certain time. And then nurse anesthesia practice was doing it at a different time that all programs across campus were ensuring that their state authorization was done at a specific date that worked with our enrollment process. So we're looking forward to getting that implemented um, to continue to just standardize what we're doing here. We're continuing to meet regularly with our ed development team and distance ed director as things continue to change and as we're enrolling new students um, and, and thinking about what this all means, um, current state and then into the future. So with that, I would open it up to any questions. Thank you, Stacey. There is one question in the chat uh, asking if you're willing to share the enrollment form. Yeah, I'd be happy to share um, the questions that we include as part of our enrollment form um, piece. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Well, thank you so much, Stacey. That was that was informative. It was a, a really great breakdown of the enrollment management process in general and how it, how it relates to state authorization today. Um, and um, I'm I'm really glad you're able to, uh, to to come on with us. I'm sorry about any confusion on the, the time zones. Um, now I will kick it over to Cheryl for some information about something that's happening on December 1st. Great, thank you very much, Dan. Um, did my screen come back? Just wanting to check. Do you yes. see the agenda? Okay, wonderful. I do. And, I do. and I just wanna thank um, Patty and Stacy for coming on to uh, talk with us about how things are working at their institutions right now. It's always helpful to hear what our colleagues have going on and, and how they're managing at this time. Um, and uh, Stacy, if you could, if you would um, perhaps maybe email me that please um 
So anyway, well, here we are. Um, you may note at the bottom here, of course, my internet is now unstable, it says. Um, you may note at the bottom of this, um, of this agenda that we indicate that in November and December, we're not going to have the regular fourth Tuesday of the month meeting. And that's the reasoning is uh, the fourth Tuesday of the month comes on Thanksgiving week. And then um, the fourth Tuesday of December um, falls during Christmas holidays. Uh, so what we are going to do is we recognize that our in-person meeting was not able to happen this year because the WCET annual meeting was uh, moved to virtual as our other conferences um, at this time. So we're going to move our um, in-person meeting to be virtual. And uh, so, yes, you may wonder, well, Cheryl, how is that really any different than what we do monthly um, you know, with our coordinator calls? Well, we're going to make this one a little bit more special. We're going to move to a 90-minute format. We're going to be on December 1st. You note that December 1st falls on a Tuesday. We're just going to start a half an hour earlier. It'll be a 90-minute format, as I said. Um, and we also would like you to invite a guest. You'll be receiving an invitation with all of these uh, pertinent pieces of information. So uh, don't worry about um, remembering all that I'm sharing at the moment, other than to say, we really hope that each of you will invite a guest uh, to come to this virtual coordinator meeting. Uh, as I said, it'll be 90 minutes. We'll start off with kind of a state of the network. Uh, Russ Poulin will give us um, some introductory words. We'll talk about long range planning for SAN and uh, event planning. Then we're gonna move into something that's very traditional to um, a SAN coordinator in-person meeting and that's table talks. You may recall that on uh, many previous years, we have given tables the opportunity to amongst themselves talk about a particular issue, uh, share information, problem solve. Um, and we're gonna do a virtual format of that within Zoom rooms. So we want to make sure that we have that interactive portion so that you'll be meeting with others um, that are coordinators as well and have some time to interact. So that will be in the middle of our meeting. And then we will uh, end the meeting with a guest presenter. We're nailing down the guest presenter at this time. So I don't want to indicate who that is yet in case things fall through, but they hopefully shouldn't. Uh, but I think you'll be pleased with uh, what we do for our um, our presentation that's a part of that program as well. So as I said, it's going to be a 90 minute program. It will be a substitute for the November and December uh, regular meetings, but you, you all coordinators are welcome. We would like coordinators to invite a guest. It could be anybody at the institution or if you're part of a large membership, if you want to invite somebody from another institution that's part of the membership, that would be great too. So we hope that, um, that you all will find this to be an interesting um, option since we can't meet together in person this year. And you will receive in the uh, coordinator um, part of WCET Mix, the coordinator community, you will see a registration opportunity and um, more information so that you have that invitation with all the pertinent details. And Dan, I am gonna throw it back to you. Okay, well, um... I was going to, our, our next section is welcome new coordinators for October. There is one new coordinator. So please join me in welcoming Nicole Redding from Portland Community College. Um, if you know, Nicole, if you know Portland Community College, uh, if, if any other ways of reaching out, please do. Um, and uh, we're happy to have Nicole on board. Other business, Cheryl. Great. Um, one other piece of business to share today is that, uh, I'm going to be sending you all a quick survey and you know that, you know, it's SAN's role um, of continuing to want to help with strategy building. And we recognize that there are other areas of compliance that we may need to touch upon. And something that came to the top here was managing CRAC guidelines. And I recognize that uh, there has been some discussion about updates to the CRAC guidelines. If you all know the history of the CRAC guidelines, you know, it goes way back, I think it was 2009. And uh, these CRAC guidelines were initially um, part of uh, a study, um, a 2006 study and the 2009 best practice strategies to promote academic integrity uh, for online education that WCET put out. So, you know, it came from that. So it is time for there to be um, an update. So we recognize that, but we also realize that the philosophy of the CRAC guidelines will not go away. It's still going to be important to um, 
have certain standards of quality for distance education. So what we would like to do is send the coordinators a quick survey, five, six questions about how you are managing uh, the idea of abiding by the CRAC guidelines. And so we'd like to get a little bit more information to see if we can be of some assistance in that area as well. So you will be receiving this uh, within the next week. Um, we hope that you will participate. It's only going to the coordinators because we really just want to see a sampling of um, some varied responses of how that's working at the institutions. It will be anonymous. Um, so you, there doesn't need to be any concern there, but we would like to see perhaps an honest representation of how this is working at the institutions. So um, please look for that in your inbox as well. So in the next 10 days or so, you're going to be receiving two things. Uh, the coordinators will be receiving things. One will be the invitation for the annual meeting that will be virtual and also this quick survey about the CRAC guidelines. And so um, we're looking forward to be able to share those with you. Um, I want to point uh, two things out here. There is still time to register for the WCET annual meeting second week of the virtual seminar series. Uh, you can still register for that. Uh, that will uh, start up again next week, but you still can register for that. Also, um, we will be having open forum at its regular times in November and December, uh, despite the fact that we're moving the, um, the coordinator call. We still will have open forum the second Tuesday of November and the second Tuesday of December. This is an important series. Institutions often ask us who's doing good work, and we have um, wonderful um, information to share from some of our institutions that have won sensational awards, specifically the 2020 winners of this year. So um, next up will be University of Michigan. I'll actually be heading up to Ann Arbor tomorrow uh, to be able to share the award with uh, Ricky LaFosse and his team. And uh, we will have some pictures from that and they will be presenting on their project, which you can find on the SAN website. Um, and we will record their presentation as we have the OSU uh, presentation, the UMKC presentation. You can find those on the SAN website already. Um, and then we will conclude this series in December uh, with our friends from uh, University of Kentucky. So we're looking forward to these next two months uh, continuing this series of sensational award-winning projects. And so we hope you will join us. Um, that is all I have, Dan. Uh, any closing Comments? No, no, none for me. Well, anybody have any other uh, additional issues that you would like to raise or comments you would like to make today? Uh, somebody asked me earlier about um, whether you need to be a member um, to be the guest that you bring, that a coordinator brings, and you do not need to ask a member. It could be a non-member. We would like to be able to share what the good work is that SAN's doing, so please feel free to invite a non-member as well. Well, we had sensational guests today. Uh, Dan did a bang up, do up job um, inviting these special guests today. So their presentations were really helpful. So thank you, Dan, for your work today to bring them together. Yep, happy to do it. All right, folks. Well, that looks like our, our time is done. I hope everyone has a great week and uh, we look forward to seeing you at Open Forum in just a couple weeks. All right, thanks everybody. Bye-bye.